we are it's not that we are intelligent more than everybody it's not that we have um, a kind of ability that others don't have it's not that what else can we say we have a degree we have a master's in theology master's in divinity phd in theology that's why we know all these things no it's just god who has helped us it's just god who has opened our hearts it's just sovereign is god's sovereign grace that made us to know the truth we just finished a class in fof now and somebody <laughs> somebody got us sad you know having been a pastor for this why i know you don't even know what the gospel is that is sad how can we know the gospel how can we do know it it's not degree it's not age it's not location it's just god's sovereign grace each time I ponder on God's sovereign grace, it always leads me to give thanks. Now I'm beginning to understand Sister Francisca's favorite scripture, Ephesians 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's Sister Francisca's favorite scripture. Each time I ponder on God's sovereign grace that saved us, you will always end up on verse 6, which is glory, praise. I mean, I can't find reason in me. I can't, can you find reason in you that made you to believe or to understand? Brothers and sisters, the faith to believe the gospel, the faith to believe that the gospel is true, the faith to believe that the word of God is true, is God that gives that grace. That's why we cannot lay claim to anything in this salvation journey. It's God that made this gospel believable. It's God that made his word believable. Promise of Christ, promise of eternal life, promise of heaven. We don't have evidence of all these things, but it's so tangible in our hearts because God gave us that grace. But, Go ahead, sir. But, 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 you see, we have two baths as Christians. Natural baths, you have no hand in it. Second bath, you have no hand in it. Hallelujah. Do you know? Yeah. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul was speaking in the uh, uh, Philippi, the Bible says that the Lord opened the heart of uh, Dorcas. If Lord does not Act open 16, your heart. Act 14, 16. Yeah, you, you know, 16, 14. 16, 14. You cannot. And that is where, you know, my own favorite thing is in uh, Romans 8, 28. So he's the one that called. He's the one that we justify. He's the one that we glorify. You have no hand in it. Hallelujah. What else can we say? Then to say, Lord, we thank you. So together as a family, let's thank the Lord. Let's thank God. He it, it took away all our burdens. He took away. And that's why the only thing we can say is to give God thanks. He said, Jeremiah 9, 23, let him that boast, boast in this fact that he knows me alone. Father, we thank you because we know you alone. We thank you because all this journey into our faith was initiated by you. When we ask for a reason why you did this, that's human pride. But we know you did this because of your love. Love that was initiated by you without any counsel, without anybody bullying you, without anybody talking you to doing it. In fact, the love was made before the foundation of the world. <laughs> we cannot fully understand you, but help us to just love you Help us to be appreciative. Help us to love you, know you. Help us to always have a grateful heart, Lord. We don't even know how to thank you enough. I don't even know the right word to use to give you thanks. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know how to express the joy in my heart, the joy of eternal life, the joy of salvation. We come with a grateful heart. And in the same light, brothers and sisters, let's come into this class, into God's end, particularly as we are coming to the end in this journey, in the book of Job. Give us a fresh understanding of your sovereignty. And Lord, the reason why Job, J James made us to come into this book is to understand how to be patient. To be patient because you are a God that is perfectly in charge, perfectly in control of all you created. If you can control the sea, you control the rock, you control the wind, you control the weather, you control the sun, you control the moon, you control the animals, <laughs> you also control us. And that's why James wants us to come see this, to see that God is in charge, God is in perfect control. Help us to see this today, Lord, as you come to an end. Let your peace that surpasses human understanding flood 
our hearts in all our troubled waters. For those who are going through troubled waters now in our midst, Father, please grant them peace. For those who are in the middle of trouble, please grant them peace. For those whose trouble is still going to come, prepare us ahead. And for those whose trouble has passed, please let them find comfort in the past. In all of our journey lives, help us to know that you are in charge. <laughs> it's even in charge of demons. It's in charge of angels. It's in charge of everything. Nothing passes through his blind spots because he's God. Give us the understanding today. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, God is in charge. That is the summary of the book of Job. We can stop now and say the Bible study is over. God is in charge. The prologue began in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. The most dreadful thing on earth today among those who don't know God is Satan. Go online, go to YouTube and check. We always make this reference. Check CAC, MFM, Redeem Winners. Check the team of their programs. It's always Satan centered, Satan focused, Satan centered, Satan focused. Because they dread the Satan so much and they forget that it's a created being. But the book of Job opened to us that God summoned Satan. Chapter one, maybe you forgot in chapter one. Chapter two again, God summoned Satan. In fact, this text says God summoned Job chapter one. Job chapter 1, verse 6. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Uh, another text, we call those angels in the original. They are called the sons of God. And Satan is part of them. Satan originally wasn't, wasn't, this, wasn't created a bad person, a bad creature. We know that in Isaiah 14, um, pride was found in him and it was cast down from heaven. So it's God's creation. And we also saw that in chapter one and chapter two, that Satan could not dare near Job except the authority that the sovereign Lord gave to him. God is in charge. And we want to continue today. We saw the, the contention in this narrative. Where did the contention come from? The contention came from God himself. Job, let me use Nigeria kind of English. Job was on his own, dege. He wasn't looking for trouble. And it, it was God that caused the trouble. Because even Satan wasn't pointing attention on him. It was God that said, have you seen Job? God initiated the trouble. Job was on his own, dege. So the trouble came from the realm that Job doesn't know. Now, Job's friend, used many intelligent, clever methods to explain this God, and they all failed. They all failed woefully. Some of them are using what we call experience-based theology. Because have you seen the elders? Based on these things, in life, when you do good, you get good. When you do bad, you get bad. That is experience-based theology. And that is talking like, that's like forcing your experience to fit doctrine. Is that not what we still do today? People forces experience to fit doctrine. So are, our teaching before starts with a preconceived notion. <laughs> then we force that teaching into a text. It's called back it up theology. You just go and look at the Bible to back it up. But I just for my church. I was in the house yesterday doing a job and they were connected to but I just for my church. No. But I just for my shrine. <laughs> and the pastor was preaching yesterday. He said, Hope made hope change the story of Job. Job hey. 14, 14. I will wait until my change comes. I said, Well, I just where are you? <laughs> hope changed the story of Job. As soon in as much as Job had hope, his story changed. Yeah. Of course, they will not change the text. I can never be found there again. <laughs> he can never what? <laughs> be found there again. <laughs> That's his shrine. <laughs> he said, I mean, I was life 
service. He said, hope, change the story of Job. You just keep your hope alive. Job 14, 14. Hmm. And the judge too were writing notes. I pity them, intelligent people, adults, grown up adults. Oh my shield. Anyway. So, sorry, you see, this kind of thing, I, I love what uh, Charles said one day. And what he said was that if you want to preach the Bible, just use the title that was preached. Somebody was given, a, um, um, sorry, somebody was given a title yesterday to do divine light. I said, what is divine light? He called me. He said, they gave her something, divine light. I said, divine light. What's divine light? What's the meaning of divine? So something that proceeds from God. So what is light? Why do I have to give you? Did they give you a passage? He said, no. They just said you should speak on divine light. I said, well, that passed me. I don't know what to say without light. <laughs> because they want you to look for every part where there is uh, 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 light. And then you'll be speaking on it and you're speaking on it. So I said, so, a... Pastor, you can't help me. I said, no, I can't help you. Because they have got the answer. <laughs> From the beginning, they know what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They don't want any other thing other than that. Mm -hmm. Experience and if you go throughout Nigeria now, where I am, the only thing that can bring you people there, divine their truth. Divine this, divine that, divine, and that's it. Sorry, sorry to intrude, I'm sorry. <laughs> Experience-based theology. So we have our preconceived notion. We force it into the scripture. No, a faithful minister teaches the Bible and you move towards the authorian intent. So our journey into truth starts from the Bible. You open it and you follow it through and it goes towards the authorian intent. What does God intend? That is a faithful minister. But an unfaithful minister have a preconceived notion. Yesterday, the church, that, that shrine, somebody is asking for the name of the shrine. Let's keep it for this recording's sake. The shrine, the title of the preaching was Kingdom Principles for Victorious Living. <laughs> Do I have to go to church to know that? I don't need to go to church to know that. Okay? So, Job's friend did things like that. They forced the first experience into truth, and God proved all of them wrong. We also saw a friend that looks like he's intelligent. Eli, 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 or what's his name? Eli, we're not going to read him because all of them are going towards the same direction. Is he Eliu or Eli? Okay, Eli, 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 Eli. He also came, he's the youngest out of these three friends. The three friends of Job were older. He has been there all the while. He didn't talk because he's younger. You will see that from chapter 32. And he too came to that conclusion. It, it sounded like he was intelligent. It sounded like he was going to go into another, in, in, in the right direction. At the end, he too is also making the same position. Job, you see it, confess. But we all know that the problem of Job was on his own, they get. But the problem was not him. It was God proving a point. So we're going to jump to chapter 19. We'll, we'll read just one chapter, chapter 19. Then we will not jump to 38. For me, I'm done reading what his friend says that wasn't correct. I want to hear what the Lord say. What does, I want to hear when the Lord is speaking. So we want to hear the authorial intent. Every other part they were just saying their own. So this is where people come up with say, by saying that the Bible is not the word of God. It contains the word of God. After all, these guys do not represent the view of God. When you talk like that, it's because um, who gave these guys microphone? Does, does someone give them microphone and they're just talking? It's a narrative account. And the narrative came. This is an insider information. You will see in just chapter 19 that apparently all these guys didn't know that this thing is going to become scriptures for us. So God revealed this to the writer of the book of Job. This is an insider information. Nobody was there writing, no typewriter, no record. But God gave someone many assumptions. Maybe Moses, he looked at Moses' writing because the activities here match between Genesis 6 and Genesis 11, particularly after the uh, Genesis 11. We don't have evidence, but it looks like that. Some people also say because it has some wisdom literature, so it could be Solomon. I don't know. So this is not given. But what my point is that it's an insider information. There's no typewriter. There was no typewriter. There was no recording why it was happening. 
and eventually somebody penned it down in these holy scriptures. That is why it's called the word of God. So God actually spoke. These people spoke, but we cannot deny, you cannot break it and say the Bible does not, it just contains the word of God. It's not the word of God. <laughs> what was the source? The source for everything was a narrative account from the mouth of God. So that makes the Bible entire, in its entirety the word of God. So let's go to chapter 19. Job, laid, Job says something very important that we also help us to have confidence in the word of God. They will now go to when the Lord began to speak, chapter 38, and we'll finish the book today. I'm done with all this, all what his friends are saying. Their maxims, tradition, experience. I'm done with that. Let's go into what the Lord says and let's find out that. Chapter 19, who wants to read for us? Chapter 19, verses 1 to the end. Chapter 19, then Job replied, How long will you torment me and crush me with words? Ten times now you have reproached me. Shamelessly you attacked me. If it is true that I have gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. If indeed you would exalt yourself above me and use my humiliation against me, then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Seven, though I cry, violence, I got not, I got, I get no response. Though I call for help, there's no justice. He has blocked my way, so I cannot pass. He has shrouded my path in darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He tears me down in every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. He anger, his anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies, he, his troops advance in force. They build a siege, a siege ram against me and a camp around my tent. He has alienated my family from me. My, acquaint my acquaintance are completely estranged from me. My relatives have gone away. My closer friends have forgotten me. My guest and my female servant count me a foreigner. They took they look on me as on a stranger. I summon my servant, but he does not answer. Though I beg him with my own mouth, my bread is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own family. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped only by the skin of my feet. Have pity on me, my friends, have pity. For the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? Or that my words were recorded? that they were written on the straw, 24, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on, lead on, lead, sorry, lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. If you say, how will, how we will pound him since the root of the trouble lies in him, you should fear the sword yourself. For wrath will bring punishment by the sword and then you will know that there is judgment. Praise God. So you, there was something we ended with in the last time when we met, that Job has an insider information outside of his syllabus, or outside of the syllabus of his time. Maybe Psalm and Isaiah. Maybe I don't, Isaiah, maybe Isaiah 6, six the last chapter. There are more of Psalm. Psalm also has inclination about the life after. 
than Job. Most of the Old Testament writers or the Old Testament guys don't know that there's going to be a life after. Because it was Christ that brought immortality, that brought life, that, that brought immortality into life. It was Christ that did that. So here you see what Job was saying in verses um, 26. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. This is, the Bible is very prophetic. And the, what this chapter is going to reveal to us is the nature of the Bible. Then we will go to chapter 38 and continue. It's important for us to rekindle afresh in our hearts the nature of the Bible. One of the features of prophetic writings is that on one hand, prophetic writing is happening right now, like Moses, but on the other hand, is pointing to something of greater significance. That's called shadows, types, antitypes, and all the likes. We all know the story of Exodus. Moses was in Pharaoh, was with Pharaoh. He did all those stuff. When you go to Mark, John chapter 5, verses 40 to 46, Jesus said, if you had believed in Moses, you would have believed in me, for he wrote about me. Really? Did Moses ever mention the name Jesus? How come Jesus said Moses wrote about me? That's the nature of prophetic writing. In Hebrews, to explain this, look at what, um, before I go to Hebrews, in this, um, our chapter 19 of Job, Job says something, oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll. This is not tells you that Job did not write this book. He wished that these things were recorded. He wished that these things were engraved in a scroll. That tells you that Job did not write this thing. And that makes this Bible, this all this qualifies to be the word of God. We cannot say because Elihu spoke, Bida spoke, and what they spoke was wrong, therefore you cut it away. But still, you cannot go there to hold the doctrine. You understand what I mean? It's a narrative. It's a narrative pointed somewhere. It's all coming from the mouth of God through a writer. So it, it wasn't Job that wrote it. It was someone that God gave this light to that wrote it. And they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead and all engraved on rock, in rock forever. This is mind-blowing for me. What you'll be saying, I hope is connecting in our mind. He's saying that I wish these things were written and these things were engraved on rock forever. And truly it was engraved forever. This is an old story. And yet it's getting to our hand Today, June 6, 19, 2021, what Job was thinking. So that tells you that there's something behind. Because if you look at um, First Peter chapter 1, verses 25, First Peter chapter 1, what lasts forever? First Peter, oh, where are you? Okay, Brian, please read First Peter 1, 25 for us. First Peter 1, 25. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. What endures forever? The word of the Lord. Of the Lord. Again, Isaiah 42, 8. Peter was quoting Isaiah there. So what does Isaiah say? Isaiah 42, you said? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Isaiah 42, 48. 48. Isaiah 48. Oh, sorry. 48. 48 says, the, gr the grass wither and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Endures forever. Now, Job is saying this, that I wish these things were recorded. My words were recorded. I wish they were written on a scroll that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in a rock forever. What lasts forever? Word of God. The word of the Lord. It's the word of the Lord that lasts forever. This was how God communicated his words when there was no printing press. This is one of the, this is uh, one thing that today's class will do. It will rekindle our, our trust back in the word of the Lord. 
the word of the Lord came through many means. Hebrews 1. This is one of Balakan's favorite scriptures. Everybody here, but Baba has a favorite scripture. This has a favorite scripture. But this one is Balakan's favorite scriptures. Hebrews 1. If you meet Balakan's at 12 midnight, you know Hebrews 1 1. <laughs> 1 <and> 2. <laughs> Me, I don't know my favorite scripture. All right. Hebrews 1. Let's use, um, I'm going to use NKJ and NLT. God would at God who at various times in various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now let's break that word God in various times. In KJV, it says God at sundry times. So that word God in various times in Greek means polymerous. God who at sundry times, it means polymerous. And what does that mean? It means by many portions, by many times, in many ways. God, by many portions, by many times, in many ways. In various ways, spoke in the time past. In the KJV said, in diverse manners. That means polytropos, by various methods. Like, for example, David saw burning bush. Daniel had a vision at night. Jeremiah had direct prophecy. Moses wrote most of the things he wrote except Genesis 1 to 3 from collection of memories. It wasn't that. One angel began to reveal those things to Moses. It was from collection of memories. You realize that in Genesis, you find a lot of uh, genealogy. And this began this, and this began that. Those were collection of memories that Moses penned down after uh, he was educated. You see Solomon. Solomon also wrote the things he wrote, you find that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 or so, last, last verse, he said, out of many books, he also wrote the wisdom literature from collection of books. In all of this, they sum up for us the word of God. That is one of the ways for us to know that the Bible is a truthful book. Because if the Bible had said that they used equipment to write the Bible, when those equipment were not manufactured, then that is called an anachronism. That's a lie. It's like saying there was laptop in 1980. It's like saying there was printing press in the first century. So how? And God wanted to make his redemptive plans known. So he used people. People spoke as God gave them utterances. And God ensured that these things were penned down for us. So Hebrews says, God who at various times, in various ways, spoke in the time past. We will see God speaking today in chapter 38. God does spoke in time past. And in these last days has spoken. And it says, and now in these final days, he has spoken. Brothers and sisters, this is a bitter pill to take. But if you believe the Bible, please believe the truth. Don't believe me. God is not speaking again. God is not speaking again. The scripture says at that time, he spoke to Balaam. I mean, what is the big deal for God to speak? He can speak through anything. Even animals spoke. But he's no longer doing that again. Oh, so are we saying that? God does not lead, God does not direct. Just give me a minute. We're done for Balachas. Balachas, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that the same way. Ah, sorry. So, okay, go ahead. Sorry. The same way God is no longer creating the heavens and the earth. He's no longer creating we didn't the hear you. Oh, speak louder, sir. The same way God is no longer in the business of creation. Yeah. He's the same way he has given us all we need. He has revealed his redemptive plan. Oh, Father, look at this text. Back to Job 19. In Job 19, Job said, Job 19, 23, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on, on lead or engraved in rock forever. And what is that thing? Verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives. We need that. Oh, we will ever know about the redemption plan of God has been written. What else do we want again? What else? Even in the Old Testament, God wasn't, wasn't talking rubbish. 
and God will not tell me the slippers I will wear today. Don't wear these slippers. Wear that one. Even the Old Testament. Was he saying this kind of rubbish? He wasn't talking rubbish in the Old Testament. There was one thing in the mind of God. Redemptive plan. And he kept, he kept, you know, in many portions, through many polytropos, through many methods, many ways, in dream, in vision, even animals spoke out his plan. So what is the big deal? If God wants to speak today, he will speak, but why should he? What is the greatest, deepest secret that God wants to reveal? Bible told us, John, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is the greatest. We want deeper truth. Jesus said, Jesus warned us against deeper truth. What is the deepest that God wants to discuss about? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the spirit search. What is that? First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8. Let's start from verse 6. Mm -hmm. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For are they known they would not have crucified the Lord Jesus. So what is the mystery there? The mystery is Christ. Mystery means mysterion. Something kept secret, not revealed. It was kept secret, right? So this is the greatest secret that God wants to communicate. But it is written, eyes have not seen, nor ear nor had, nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. But the spirit searches such as searches all things yes the deep things what is that deep thing christ christ is the deeper thing is the deepest thing so if you know christ you know the deepest what else do we want again if the spirit searches search for deep things after this it's called deeper truths you find deeper truth in revelation chapter 2 verses 24 what does god god call deeper truth let's go there just as a way of review. I want us to have confidence back in the word of God. Revelation 2.24. Let me use NLT. Revelation 2.24. Now I say to the rest of you in Tyretra. Oh, yeah. oh, I so slow today, my tablet. Revelation I 2.24. say to you, mm -hmm. I say to the rest of you in Tyretra, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secret. I will not impose any other burden on you. Let me read it from NLT. I read it some, maybe NKD, right? And NLT says, but I, but I also have a message for the rest of you in Tyretra who have not followed this first teaching, in bracket, deeper truths. We know the deep thing of God. The deep thing of God is Christ. If you are looking for something that is deeper than Christ, then you are looking for deeper truths. What is deeper truth? As they call them, depth of Satan. As for me, I'm done with the deep things of God. I don't know about you, but I know if you want deeper things, you want God to, talk, to speak to you, maybe you want something deeper than Christ. The, this is resurrected Christ. He called deeper truth, depth of Satan. Hebrews said God had spoken. It doesn't mean that God is not leading. It doesn't mean that God is not directing. And we will look into those ramifications as we move, on, move forward. So what this verse 19, chapter 19 of Job is putting in our hands is the nature of the word of God. God, if when heaven and earth work was created, there was full technological uh, advancement from day one. The Bible will have come through tablets, um, iPad, or this means that we know now. But at that time, we don't have all these means. So it came this way, through people. God spoke through people. If I let's look at one, then we go to chapter, chapter 38. Let's look at one of those ways. Act chapter 1, verse 16. Act chapter 1, verse 16. Let me use NLT. Brothers, brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus? This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. 
This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit. Uh -uh. Holy Spirit. How did the Holy Spirit speak his book through King David? That's why the Bible is the very word of God. If it was, so that is in Psalm what now? This thing that Peter was quoting. Who, who knows where that Psalm is? I think I missed it. Where is that Psalm? Oh, I can't find it. I can find it here. Psalm 109. Psalm 109. Psalm 109, yeah. KJV said, NKJV put this thing this way. Uh, Acts 116. Men and brethren. This scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spake before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Psalm 109. Psalm 109, what's the verse? No, Psalm 41. Um, uh, verse 9 too. Verse 8. Because may another take his place. Psalm 49, verse 1. Too. Let me try Psalm 49, verse 1. First. 49. 49, verse Psalm. 109. 41 verse 9. Okay. Psalm so that they will nine. live forever. Verse 9. Okay, what do you say? So that they should live on forever and not... Psalm 41 verse 9. Mm -hmm. Even my familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has slipped up his ill against me. Psalm 41 yeah. verse 9. Oh, anyway, oh, oh, oh. what I'm picking out is the nature of the Bible. The way at this time, if there was typewriter, mass press, it would have come like that. But all those things don't exist. So God spoke through people. And it's written down. So that's why Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. This is very important. We need to always have confidence in the word of God. Second Peter chapter one. We need to always verse 20. Second Peter chapter one, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture <laughs> is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy never came by the will of man, but only, only men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this is not just an ordinary word. This is the very word of God. Job doesn't, didn't know what he was saying, but I believe God was speaking through him. He said, I wish, verses nine, chapter 19, verses um, 23, oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll. Eventually they were. That they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. The only thing that can last forever, the words that can last forever is the word of the Lord. That's why, Civilization, enlightenment had come and gone, kingdom had come and gone, man had died, countries, some countries have been resurrected, some had been destroyed, but the word of God abide forever. This is the word of the Lord. And what that word kept keeping for us is the story of redemption. He said, I know that my redeemer lives. So the word there, we always, I always say that a lot. He didn't say, I feel. That my redeemer lives. He didn't say, I think that my redeemer lives. Our story of redemption is in direct proportion to how much God has revealed. Ephesians 1. Our story of redemption. The more we know how much God has revealed, the more redemption will be clear to us. Ephesians 1 8. Or let's even start from verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he had made a ban to us, towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Look at NIV. NIV of that version says, okay, NIV of that version, in him, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He lavished redemption on us in all wisdom and understanding. So the more understanding of what God has done, the more understanding, that, the more of that understanding that we have, the more the story of redemption will be clear. You remember that our old song that we sang during the song, the hymn we sang during 
root class. Uh, great things he has taught us, great things he has done. The more we know what he has done, or the more we learn about what he has done, the clearer the redemption package will be. That's why, please, brothers and sisters, hate any church that claims to be church but have a screwed view of redemption. That is not a church. Hate any preacher that can vibrate and preach but has a screwed view of redemption. So, you see the Job, book of Job now is connecting back to Christ again. He wants the book written forever and it's the word of God that lasts forever. That's why it's the word of God. And what is that thing that God is communicating through many means in the Old Testament? The story of Christ. So Jesus came and said, if you have believed Moses, you will have believed me because he wrote about me. Everything leads to Christ. Now that Christ has come. That's why now Hebrews 1 now says, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Now says, in the past, it, come on, come on. God who at various times in various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by his son. It's not, look at that word, it's not speaking, high and G. It's not continuous, ongoing. All that needed to be said about redemption has been said. God still lead us because as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. God still leads us. At times, even where he's leading you, you'll be in trouble. We saw that, we saw that Job here got himself in trouble without any problem of ease. So success, affluence, is not a proof that God is leading you. Oh, how do you know God is leading you? He will always lead you in the path of righteousness. And the path of righteousness is the path of success. The path of a righteous man shining brighter and brighter. Uh -huh. Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, I want Brother Hero to pay attention to this. And you're going to repeat that. What Paul said, but you are... Verse, chapter 3, verses 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, affliction, which happened to me at Iconium, at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecution I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live a godly, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How many people will suffer persecution? Right? Oh. Paul. So when we suffer, it doesn't mean that God is not leading. And when God leads, he's not going to be speaking like Job. God spoke out of the storm. That is not going to happen now. It's done. But because we have the Holy Spirit in us now, he leads us, even when you're not hearing a voice. He's, be, he's in charge. He's involved. He's directing our steps. Most of the times we look back and we see what the Lord has done. Some... We are going to chapter 38 of Job now. So I'm preparing the grant because I'm done hearing Job's friends. They are all wrong, right? I want to hear what the Lord has to say. In Psalm 71, 77 verses 19. Psalm 77 verses 19. Psalm 77 verses 19. Your ways are in the sea. Your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. And that's NKJV. Let's see NLT. Psalm 77, verses 19. Your road leads through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knows was there. If anyone tells you that I can always tell, whenever you want direction, come and meet me. I will give you vision. It's a liar. The best of us cannot capture God. It's like telling someone on the sea, how do you see the road? It's gone. Once the boat leaves that angle, you cannot trace it. That is what Sam is saying. Your road leads through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knows was there. And the olden, the olden days, God spoke. And what he was communicating was his, his redemptive plan. But now he has spoken because the greatest of revelation has appeared, which is Christ. And what do we need today? 
we need to understand what he has spoken. We need to understand. And that's why we are given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, go check it. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 25 to 26, you have an Holy Spirit who will teach you. He's not going to speak. He's going to teach. You go to John 14, 26. When the Spirit of truth is come, he will teach you. Teach. John 15, 26. He will teach you and reveal me to you. You go to John 16. It's the same thing. What the Holy Spirit will do today is to teach us what has been spoken. It's not bringing new thing. Is it going to bring new things, sir? It's not bringing new thing. It's not bringing new thing. Not bringing new thing. So, what about if I want to get married? Ah, what the dragons? How many people? Huh? Where do you get that kind of? Even in the Old Testament, who did it tell that you go and marry this or go and marry that? If you want to get married, even when they get when they get this revelation from the Holy Spirit, they still get divorced. So who told them? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, okay, you want to know the you want to know the hidden part, the the part of God that I don't know if it's that man. You start with the one that has been revealed. Start with that should not fornicate. That one should be revealed. We know that one. Start with that. Okay, people in Yoruba culture, I don't know in another culture, people want to know the destiny of their children. Really? You start with train your children first, train them first. You start with the one that is revealed. You want to know, you know what? Is that person for me? Really? It's a choice. Everybody has a choice to go for your choice. The plan of God will come to pass whichever because there's a God behind the sun. So the Holy Spirit is given to us. For as many that are led by the Spirit, we are led by the Spirit. We, but it's not going to look at two instances, Acts 17, Paul in uh, Ethics. He saw Hydros, he was great. And based on that, he addressed them. Did he hear a voice? In Acts 16, Paul was going, he saw that young lady that was uh, possessed with a uh, demon in Acts 16, 18. Paul was sad. Did he hear a voice? We are led by the Spirit. The Spirit will guide us. But still, the fact that the Spirit is guiding us doesn't mean that we won't make mistakes. At times, it's in that mistake that we will learn. He is God. And that's what Job is telling us. Job is telling us that God is all wise, all powerful, all loving, all knowing. And that's why in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, 6, he that comes to God must first believe. Believe. No, nothing to hear. Nothing to see. Just believe that God is involved. God is sovereign. And that's what we're going to see now as we wrap up Job today. 38. Let me start reading myself. Job 38, 1. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Yes, at this time, the Lord was doing that. This is not an impression. Like we saw that in Acts 17, 16, Acts 16, 18. This is not an impression. He actually spoke in such a way that Job could hear. For Hebrews told us he did that long ago, but now he's not doing it again. So whoever said the Lord told me, he did not tell him anything. We saw that too in Job, right? Job's friend, Eliphaz, said they brought it to me and he was lying. All that needed to be said has been said. So, God will not tell you to go and apply for a visa? Really? Is that how we have, we have reduced God? God is holy, God is righteous, God is just. He will not tell you to go and apply for a visa out of what the whole world. If you want to apply for a visa, you went online, you saw that Canada is good, they are doing express entry, you apply, it's your choice. But God plan we come to pass wherever we find ourselves to the point that people go to church and they are believed in a passport because god told the pastor bring your international passport it's an it's all lies <laughs> brother paul it's the same yesterday today and forever oh That's he was sleeping thing. yesterday is he sleeping today he was tired yesterday is he tired today he was hungry yesterday. Is he hungry today? Come on, read in context. Get back to that's the context. The, that's the justification they use now. <laughs> Get back to the context. All right. Then the Lord spoke. Yeah. He speaks at that time. But now he has spoken through his son. To Job, heart of this tongue, he said, Who is this that obscure my plans with uh -oh. words without knowledge? Wow. Uh -oh. You know why? In chapter 19, verses 16, Job want summoned God. Job chapter 9, verses 16. He wanted to hear God. Now it's time for him to hear God. See? Many of us always pray, God, show me your face. If you see God's face, can you stand? 
<laughs> Job chapter 9, verse 16. Job said, even if I summon him and he responds, I don't believe he would give me a hearing. It's, it's insinuating. I want to summon God. Chapter 13, verse 3. Chapter 13, verse 3. But I desire to speak to the Lord, to the Almighty, and to argue my case with God. <laughs> so Job, <laughs> I don't pity him. I mean, I don't blame him. His friend that changed his head. They have told him things that were not true. So he too wanted to summon God. And it's time. You want to summon God? Come over. And God showed up. You realize that God showed up when he wants to show up. Do you see? God showed up when he wants to show up. Anyone that have a technique to bring God. Key, seven keys to, uh, uh, to, to bringing God down. <laughs> Either it's a lie or it's witchcraft. We are not bringing Almighty God down from anywhere. God is God all by Himself. Since since chapter three, the argument has been going on. God did not respond to chapter eight because He's God. There are techniques we can use. Pastor Eddie, we'll go to the mountain for seven days. I will okay. not eat anything that has pepper and pepper and palm oil. I will talk to God and will hear. We are joking. God really doesn't use the same method for anything. He just really does do. what pleases him. Exactly. He's sovereign. The word sovereign means it takes independent action. That's no why action. he's God. No the God that uh, <laughs> your seed, your seed can push down is an idol. Because it's an idolatry. We know the food of Satan. We know the food of Shango. We know the food of Ogun. You just appease them, they respond. That is not Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, whoever is saying, bring out a seed to move God, doesn't serve Yahweh. The Yahweh that we know of is a sovereign Yahweh. He responds when he wants to respond. And that's what you we'll see here. So Job has been asking, I want to summon you. <laughs> when he asks, he did not answer. When his own time is ready, he came. Brace yourself like a man, verses 3, 38, verse 3. Brace yourself, brace yourself like a man. I will question you. And you will answer me. God is not obligated to answer our questions. He did not answer Job. Rather, he asked him questions. Now, people now say, when you come to this program, everyone will attend to you. How? How? How do you guarantee that? Where do you get that from? In fact, let's get to the Bible. From Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, NLT, 2 to 4. Brahiro, please read it for us. Hebrews 2, 2 to 4, NLT. NLT, Hebrews chapter 2, uh -huh. 2 to 4. Oh, sorry, chapter 2, 2 to 4. 2 to 4 says, For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced? By the Lord Jesus Himself, and then delivered to us by those who heard Him speak. For and God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gift of the Holy Spirit, whenever He chose. Who gives the miraculous signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, whenever He chooses? God. Me, Not part of. Me, I want to choose a day, sir. Everyone looking for the fruit of the womb, you just come on a particular day, it will happen. <laughs> Perception day. <laughs> All the singles in the house, come, I'm going to anoint you. You will get married, really. Really. See, these people are not talking about this Yahweh. This Yahweh that we are seeing now in the Bible, that is revealing himself to us. He's revealing himself to us to be a God that you cannot push around. And that is true. As I think you said, when we were born, do we know about it? When we will die, he knows already. When he was making heaven and earth, who told him to do it? He is God. See? So he said to, he said to, he said to Job, praise yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. So God is bringing out his attributes. This is where I'm going. You remember why we moved to Job? James was James gave us this hint to go to Job. James chapter 5, verse 7. He was talking about patience. James 5, 
Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and the spring. They eagerly look for the, for the valuable harvest to, to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord's name. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For example, of patience and suffering, tell brothers and sisters, look at the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. So here, James was teaching us patience, right? And he said, we should go look at an example. Look at an, look at an example. So we are looking at Job. So we are now seeing here that what really makes us to be impatient mm -hmm. is when our eyes are shifted from the attribute of God. John 14, 1. John 14, 1. Jesus said, Jesus said, come on, don't let your heart be troubled. See, when we are at a troubled time, I said this during this teaching that patience is not abstract. I'm just having patience. It's having confidence in God that you know. The God, having confidence in the attribute of God. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Then, why? Why would my heart not be troubled? He said, trust in God and trust also in me. It is when we know God, the true God, the true biblical God, that we will be able to endure. See, when this God began to say these things, Job was this sick. Miracle, miracle has not happened. And yet, he forgot the pain. When he began to see the attribute of God, he said, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Job could not talk. Tell me if you understand. This is revealing God's power. God is powerful. God is great. That's an attribute we have to see there. Who marked out his dimension? Surely, you know, this is God is wise. Who stretched a measuring line across it on what were its footing set or who laid this cornerstone why the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy this was after creation before us he's telling you that is is god the angels saw the creation which means the greatest all aspect of creations are covered god is in charge who shut up the sea behind doors, when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garments and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for heat and set its door and, and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where the proud waves halt. Brothers and sisters, God is great. God is in charge. Even the ocean, the ocean tide knows where to stop at the command of God. As, they are, as the ocean tide is coming with power, it knows where to stop because that's where God wants it to stop. He said, verse 12, have you ever given orders to the morning or showed it down its place? This is to say that when you look up in the morning, you see the sun. Who set the alarm? Who set the thermostat? Who told sun when to come? Who told sun when to go? Who told moon, darkness, when to come? God does all this. And somebody turned this to the doctrine, commanding, commanding the morning, right? Have you commanded your morning so everybody wakes up in the morning and they are commanding the morning? I command the morning, really? It's a question. It's a question. You see the narrative. Have you, com I say, have you ever given orders to the morning? In other words, he's saying that God, look at the ramifications. Is in charge of atmosphere, is in charge of nature, is in charge of angels. We find that in the verse seven. Why the morning star sang together, is in charge of the morning star. These are angels, is in charge of the water weave. Is it, ah, ah. If God is in charge of all aspects of creature, so he's not in charge of our life. Right? If God is in charge of every aspect of creature, so God is not in charge of our life. This is what God is showing you. That it might take the earth by hedges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out, stand out like those of a, of a garment. The wicked are denied their light 
and their up and their upright arms is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea, or walked in the recess of the deep? Have the gate, have the gate of death, been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanse of the earth? Tell me, if you know all this, what is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their place? Do you know the path to, the, to their dwellings? Surely, you know, for you, as, you were already born. Have you lived so many years? Have, <laughs> this is too much. Have you entered the storehouse of the snow or seen the storehouse of the hail, which is reserved for the times of trouble, for the days of war and battle? This is telling you that God is in charge and he uses all things to work out his purpose. He said, have you entered the storehouse of the snow or seen the storehouse of the hail, which is reserved for the times of trouble. In other words, he's saying that God can use nature to protect the country. God can use nature to his advantage. Even nature respond to God because all things were made by him, for him, all things were made by him, for him, and through him, right? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed? or the place where the east winds are scattered over the head. Who cut a channel for the torrents in, of rain and path for the thunderstorms to water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? <laughs> Who fathers the drop of dew? From, whom, from whose womb comes the highs? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? When the waters bec become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen, can you bind the chains of the plates? Of, of the plates? Can you lose losing Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellation in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the cloud and cover yourself with the flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts of their way? Do you report? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who gives the Ibis wisdom? Or Brother, gives... Paul, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> how, how will you ever answer any of these questions? God One will take him a thousand to... years. God doesn't expect him to answer. Even me, I'm overwhelmed hearing it. <laughs> He wants to hear God now. Maybe we want to hear God. He wants to hear. And he must answer, but he cannot. God said this for Job to see that his wisdom, his wisdom created all these things. So trust this God. He said this thing to upturn him. He has no place to stand, no ground to stand. Everything, in fact, there was everything kaput. There's no argument again. When he saw all this, this God is wise. Who has the wisdom to count the cloud? Do you see why, where God is going now? He's saying all these things and he dive into wisdom. Who gives the Ibis wisdom or gives the roaster understanding? Roaster comes at 5 a.m. To, 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 who, who put the time of starting inside the roaster? How do they know the time? When there's an eclipse, all the chicken will go and sleep as if it's night. Who put all this time of start of darkness and light in them? Is telling you that God is wise. Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jar of the heavens? Who, look at, there's a time for winter, there's a time for spring, there's a time for summer. The thing is just too accurate. It comes at the right time. Leaves know when snow. to drop their leaves for the snow to come or else the leaves will be too heavy and to break the tree. It will be too big for the tree to carry, and the trees will break down. Everything is perfectly in alignment. Summer comes at the right time, and you will see the progression with which summer fades into winter. It doesn't come suddenly. Imagine it was uh, 40 degrees today and tomorrow, minus 40. People are going to die. 
but it comes gradually it's face down it's like a thermostat it starts going down start going down they start rising up to winter even winter goes down gradually it doesn't come suddenly it moves to spring you change your cardigan from five in canada to two or to one in Calgary. Somebody is going to shoot me. You can you choose to you change your cardigan gradually from, from, from thick cardigan to light cardigan to long sleeve to short sleeve to short sneaker to slippers. Then you come back again gradually, gradually that we don't even know something is happening. That wisdom is too much. If God can control snow, winter, summer, so it's me. Me that is not in charge of. So I need to go to one mountain to appease him. I need to sow seed. I need to do something. It's me, 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 ordinary. The sand in our bodies is less than one dollar when we die. And the sand decays and the packet is less than one dollar. Our body is not important. So when it comes to us, then I told us, ah, God, you say God is not in charge. It is me, woman of God, that will not help me to abuse this God. Come on. God is sovereign. So when the dust became becomes hard, that's 38. And the clouds of earth sticking together. Do you ought to pray for the lions and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in, in, a, in, in a ticket? Who provides food for the raven? You remember? Luke 12. Ravens. If God feed the ravens, how much more you? Oh Lord, the most valuable of, God, of God's creation. If God closed the lily, Feed the ravens, how much? See this guy looking at the days of Christ. See, let's stop there. God is wise. This is all this, all this interaction is to reveal the wisdom of God that Job can trust God. He knows what he's doing. And that's why Job, James wants us to go study Job. To see, because what makes us to be patient in trouble is when we know God, knowing fully well that God is in charge of our life. One of the things trouble does is that trouble makes you think you are alone. Trouble makes you think God is far. Trouble gives you a kind of illusion that is God actually answering prayers. Because one thing you need in trouble is to come out. Imagine Jonah in the belly of the whale. He didn't pray for missionary, did he? He didn't pray for missionary. Did he pray for missionary? Did he pray for FOF? <laughs> did he, he didn't even pray for his family. He didn't even pray for his children. He's him. <laughs> Save me, Lord. He prayed for. So when we are in trouble, particularly you are in the belly of a fish, <laughs> there's one thing in your prayer point. I want, oh God, please. So when we are in the trouble time, it's, it brings us down. But that's why I, when I was praying, I said, for those who are in trouble, please, God, comfort them. And for those who whose trouble we come, because there are three stages of trouble. Either your own has come, you've passed it. Or your own is, you are in the middle of your own right now. Or your own is still coming. Whoever tells you that there'll be no trouble in this life has deceived you. This is the world we live in. And the scripture told us in Revelation 21, 1 to 4, there will be a place called new heaven and new earth, where there'll be no more pain, no more shame, no more weeping, no more, no more crying. God will be the light. But in this way, we're there right now. Be weeping, no. The truth must be said truthfully. God is God and is good. But in this moment that we live in, because we, if the whole world is made up of us, Christians, we can reduce the evil because some people have the fear of God. But the world is not led by Christians alone. Do you know the food you are eating? Some people will say, let them talk about that sin. Don't worry about that. I don't want to have a view on that. Do you know the food you are eating? You do know who made it. The children goes to school. Different enculturation and acculturation. Pastor, our pastor, his son was knocked down by a guy. You see, this is the world we live in. If the whole world was full of Christians, maybe the evil would not be eradicated completely, but it will be reduced. That's why there's going to be a day when God's good earth will be filled up with God's good people because God is a good God. But today, there are no God's good people right now all over everywhere. So there will be troubles, there will be pain, but we can be assured that in all of this, faithful is he who began this good work, who will also do it.
The Lord is with us. So we shouldn't allow any of this overwhelming thing to override the comfort and the confidence of God in our heart. Brothers and sisters, when God said all this to Job, he spoke long. Let's see, let's even see verse 39. But I do you want to see verse 39 for us? Verse 39. Then we'll go to verse 40. Job now replied. Verse 39. All right, 39. I read. Do you know when the mountain, the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the when the door bears bears her found? Do you count the months till the beer? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young, their labor pains. They are sorry, they are. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wild. They leave and do not return. Who lets the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it the wasteland as its home. The salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion on the town. It does not hear a driver's shout. It, range, it ranges the hill for its pasture and searches for any green thing. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will it stay by your, by your manger at night? Can you hold it to the furrow with the harness? Will it till? We, sorry, will it till the valley behind you? Will you rely on it for its great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to it? Can you trust it to haul your grain and bring it to your threshing floor? 13, the wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings and feathers of the stock. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm on the sand, unmindful that fox may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endure her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet, when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Do you give horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing man? Do you make it leap with a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It powers fiercely, fiercely, rejoicing in its strength and charges with into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing, and does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rather rattle against its side, along with a flashing spear and lance. In frenzy, sorry, in frenzied incitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts a heart. It catches the scent of battle from her far and, sorry, the shout of commanders and the battle cry. 26, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings towards the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells in the cliff, on a, cli on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky Rage, it's, it's its stronghold. From there, it looks for food. Please, please its one eyes one. detect it from one. afar. Its young ones feast on blood. And where the slain are, there it is. Wow. This is powerful. Is our phone not there? 
Yeah. Said to give him one minute. Yeah, so give him, that's the beauty of uh, Bible study that it's not a church that you have to be full. Uh, everything has to be drama. In Bible study, you can take out and come back again, right? So, yeah, Brother Hero, thank you. Yeah. From this text, in that chapter 39 that you read, you will see something that got me laughing because I, I just want to pick a little bit there. It spoke about uh, verse 13, chapter 39, verse 13. There are so many things, but let's pull it together. The wings of the oh. ostrich flap joyfully though they cannot compare with the wings and feature of the of the stock. Now, if you go to verse 16, she, she treats a young Ashley as if they were not hers. She cares not that the labor, that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom <laughs> or give her a share of good sense. Yet she spread her feathers to run she laughs at horse and a right and rider. Horse, horses are known for speed, right? And he's saying that this thing that you think has no wisdom in this aspect, but in that other aspect, it does a horse. She does a horse, meaning that you may think that God is stupid when he's doing his things, but he has his own reason for doing his things. You may think that. What Job was going through doesn't make sense. But when God does his things, he does them for his own reasons. And if God is wise, we should know that his reasons will overweigh our own reason. If we jump to verse chapter 40, verses 8, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? The justice system of God is excellent. But for us, our job does not deserve what is going through. But God is telling us this, that he knows why he does his things, and he has a reason for doing his things. This funny story, a man stood under the oak tree, and he saw oak seed on the oak tree. And he saw watermelon on the floor, and he thought he's wise. He said, how can God put this small oak on a tree and put this big watermelon on this shroud, I can why can't God put this oak and this water watermelon on the tree? That's where watermelon should stay. This thing God gave the watermelon cannot carry the watermelon. That's why the watermelon was is uh, on the floor, rolling on the floor. All of a sudden, the wind blew. The oak fell on the tree. Ah, he said, "Thank God, it's not watermelon." <laughs> Which means we think we are wise. We human being we think we are wise, but God, who is the Creator knows why he did everything he, he does. And God is in charge. So God, Job now responds, Job 40, verse 1. The Lord said to Job, is this way Job responded? Oh, this is not where Job said. It's the uh, continuation of the, what the Lord said. Let's jump to what Job says. Or let me also pick one more in 41. In 41. 43. 43. 43, 4 and 5. Job said that. 40, 40 verse 3. Uh -huh. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no, I have no answer. Twice, but twice, but I will say no more. What do you expect? What can you say? God doesn't expect Job to answer. God challenged Job to answer all the questions he had posed. God didn't need to know the answer. But Job needed to admit his weaknesses, inferiority, and inability to even try to figure out God's infinite mind. God's wisdom was so superior, his sovereign control of everything so complete that this was all Job needed to know. See, God, at this point, there was no healing. But Job forgot his pain when he saw how in control God is. That's what we first of all need. In trouble. You remember? Uh, Philippians pray, and the peace of God will surpass, will surpass so my understanding will flood your heart. In trouble, the first thing you want is the assurance of God's presence. That is the first thing we need. And this was what God revealed to Job his person, his nature, his character, his attribute. Job's problem has not gone, but his confidence has been restored. That's why Bible study, good one, not Bible study that I'll tell you. Today's Bible study, 
But the topic is kingdom principles for victorious living. That's not Bible study. Bible study is Bible study when we study the Bible. That gives us confidence. That gives us comfort. In this chapter 41, chapter 41, verses 11, you can go read it yourself again when you get home. So we have unpacked it. Chapter 41, verses 11. Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under the heaven belongs to me. So, brothers and sisters, we God has a need, and you're going to package your seed. You want to give it to God. You're going to raise your hand above your head. That's a lie. This just validated Act 17. What is in Act 17? Act 17, 20, what? 24? 24, 25. 26. Here is God who made the world and everything in it. Since, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in man made temples. And human hands cannot, can't serve his need, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to every, everything and he satisfy every need. For no man has, for no man, from, from one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he has determined their boundaries. God has no needs. And human hands cannot meet his need. He holds oh. nobody. God, you have to do this. So when you will not pay your tithe, you will not tell God. God, you see, oh, I've paid you my tithe. And that my life must not be tight. Really? <laughs> you have been scammed. God has no need. But it doesn't mean that we are not responsible for each other. When you see the true work of Christ, you support his. When you see a brother in need, you support them. But that is not to say that you are transacting. When you do this, God will do that. God, you see, you see what I have done. I used to sweep your church. Therefore, you, yeah, you hold nobody, nothing. We have been scammed. Whoever says, it's, ah, yes, one more seed you will sow. And to just see, Job said it. Job 41, 11. Who has, claim a, who has a claim against me that I may pay? Who? Nobody. He's God. He holds nobody. Everything under the heavens belong to me. So God has no need, brothers and sisters. You can go read it for yourself and let's finalize and see. Because James said, God is merciful. He did not leave Job like that. So we just suffer for nothing. Chapter 5, verses 11. James 5, 11. He said, James said, we give, honor, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. So God was kind to Job at the end. He actually, he first of all settled his confidence through his attributes. Then God helped Job. Then, the, then Job replied the Lord, verse 42, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. This is just profound. That was what San Francisco taught us today. If you like, get all the best wisdom to thwart the purpose of God, you are joking. Uh, I can confess. When I confess, God will just move. You are joking. God moves when he wants to move. He does what he wants to do. Still, we are still, com we are still uh, commanded to pray because prayer gives God glory. Prayer brings us into intimacy with God. Prayer also helps us to align with the will of God. Brothers and sisters, doing the will of God is not always easy. We have so much prophecy about Jesus in the Old Testament. Even himself said at age 12, I am here to do my father's business. When the time came, he said, Lord, let this cup pass over me. Then he began to pray. Not your will, not my will, but your will be done. If Jesus found it difficult to do the will of God, but through prayer, he was empowered to do the will of God. So who are we? That's why we still have to pray. Because God's ways are not our ways. That's what Job is saying. I know that. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. This is important. God will is sovereign. Your prayer point cannot change him. Your seed cannot change God. What God wants to do, he will do. 
You asked, who is this that obscured my plan without knowledge? You remember? It was God's plan from the beginning. Surely I spoke of things I do not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Lord, listen. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. He repents from his pride. It is human pride to want to, you want God to always give you explanation for what he's doing. Mm. You want, you want to know. I want to know everything God showed me. And you want God's answer to every of your inquiries is God's is human pride. We want, I want to know that. So anyone looking for a prophet, you want to ease your human pride because Romans 12, 1 and 2 told us, be not be confirmed to the world, but be it transformed by the union of your mind that you may know the perfect and acceptable will of God. To know the will of God, you don't bypass your mind. Either by going through a prophet, is bypassing your mind, or by using technique that will help you to press into the divine. We don't need that. That is human pride. So Job repented from human pride. He wants God's answer. Whenever we are not satisfied with what God has revealed, we want more. Uh, it's a symptom of God's human pride. It's a symptom of man's pride. So after the Lord had said this, these things to Job, he said to Elipas, the Terminite, I'm hungry with you. We have read this over and over. I your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a bunch of friends. As at this time, they are going to Job and he is not healed yet. But his mind has left that one now. You see, as at this time, he's still sick in the body, but his mind is strengthened in the Lord. See, now take seven bulls and, and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering to yourself. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So, Elipaz, the Terminite, Bidad, the Shutite, and Zophar, the Nematite, did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer for them. After Job had prayed for his friend, the Lord restored his fortune. He did not even pray about his own problem again. He's now lost in the plan of God. God knows our problem. He knows when to solve it. He knows how to solve it. He's in charge. He sees everything. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and hurt with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and gold and a gold ring. Verse 12. Verse 12. The Lord blessed the later part, the later life of the Lord blessed the, the later part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, and a thousand yoke of oxen and thousand donkey and a thousand donkey and he also had seven sons and three daughters they didn't mention his wife well, obviously he must have gotten it through somebody right maybe his wife maybe they, I, didn't, I didn't mention her name as long as soon as she made her statement in chapter 2 verses 9 she fizzled out of the scene we don't know where she was or where she is but we know that job had new, more children and uh, verse 19 nowhere in all the land where they found women as beautiful as job's daughter and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died an old, an old man and full of years. James explained everything. God is merciful. God is merciful. God is, Job said, in, and James 5.11, he said, a man of great, uh, you can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end when his purpose was achieved. If you ask me, God, why did you put Job through this trouble? I don't know. All I know is God is wise, God is powerful, God is in charge, and God is in control. This world is for us to have hope and to trust the attribute of God. At this point, I don't know if you have a contribution, if you have, uh, before we pray. 
it's interesting. That Bro, Paul, why did you leave Job 38 to alone? You just read it and you went like that. No, but I, we, we spoke about it. Is that not uh, command you the money? How you, you went here or you were frozen? Okay, well, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was yeah. a book that is selling more, more than 12 million of it sold, more than 12 million of lies. I didn't get you, sir. You are far from your computer. Oh, I, I said he sold that book more than 12 million of ah. lies. Yeah, and the Cindy money, the trim, Cindy trim. Con Commanding your money. Oh, damn. Yeah, because people took departed from systematic Bible study. So who, who yes. did that? Who wrote that book, please? Ah. Tim the Trim. Oh, look, I oh. wrote a version in Nigeria, too. There's another American version, okay. too. Commanding, command. Oh, okay. Command, what do, is it? Command ye, I'll be commanding your money. Command the money. Command the money. <laughs> Is a question, and the question was revealing the attribute of God. So there's no doctrine there. It's, you know, it's a rebuke, not it's a, a rebuke. question. It's a rebuke. It's a rebuke. Total one. Sister Kemi, go ahead, man. Oh, yes, sir. So, where um, you mentioned something like um, um, when you were talking about paying tithe and all the other thing that you cannot say you have paid your tithe, then you now say, okay, God. We will now do this. Now, what about this uh, line in the Bible that says that bring God to remembrance? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, that says that bring God, bring me to remembrance. There is a passage in the Bible that says that. Uh, open the place for us. I'm waiting too. Uh, let uh, mm -hmm. my brother, let Charles open it for me. <laughs> Ah, I don't because, know. Is it that we read it for us? Are you reading no, it? Because? No, because it's, it's very, he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, but the question <laughs> is remembrance of what? No, that God says that bring me to remembrance. So now, when that is put in play, it will not be like, oh, Lord, oh, I'll pay my title. I've been serving you. Now, do this for me. Does God forget? Oh, Ori, Lori, Ori, Lori, did I know me? We need to remind you. As I have for the three twenty six, right? Okay, what does it say, sir? Sir Kami, what do you believe? Let me is see. that right? N N NKJV version. Ah, uh, sir, I'm saying that the Bible, there's a line in the Bible that says that bring God to remember. Okay. That says bring me to remember. Isaiah 43, 26. I can't remember the passage now. But you know the say, line. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Bring God to remember. And then you will now pray and say, Lord, I have done this, I have done that. It, there is also uh, Malachi chapter 3. It is Malachi, yeah. Mm -hmm. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Say, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Mm. That they... Mm -hmm. That uh, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, okay. And Brother see Valentine. if I will not throw open the front gates of heaven Brother and Valentine. pour out so much blessing. Mm -hmm. Brother Valentine. Yeah. What is the difference between synagogue, temple, and storehouse? Ah. Uh, I hope uh, you're not trying to divert that one. The, no, Star Kemi, don't worry. I'm, I'm reading your text. I'm the temple, the temple was primarily God's house, where <laughs> he had three compartments. <laughs> and in the temple, you had a storehouse. The synagogue was, uh -huh, the synagogue was, uh, devil's house. Uh, uh, was also God's house, but. Uh, it was composed of at least, I think, 12 members. They start mm. a synagogue. Mm. Uh -huh. But so the storehouse was where they used to keep agricultural produce. Okay. At least, um, at least the issue of tithing, I don't know. I had been a Seventh-day Adventist before, before I rejected Christianity in back long time ago, until when I went to Nigeria, God opened my eyes. And when God opened my eyes, the first thing he did was he shut the door so that I should not go back to Seventh-day Adventism. I think I should have just gone. But when I discovered the truth of tithing in 1997, 
I said, oh, they have dealt with us. I normally give, I give tight, but I don't give tight with the mentality, with this mentality in place. I was asked one day to teach tight. I told the pastor that if I teach tight, there will be no money in this church. They say, you don't believe in tight? I say, yes, I don't believe. But they say, oh, give. I, I know that we need money to advance God's work. So there is, this thing has hooked people from all churches, all churches. Okay, uh, quick answer. There's only one temple and that temple is in Jerusalem. And God just put his name on it. So not like, like I put my, Solomon said that I know you cannot, you, you don't live in the house beauty and just put your name on it. Mm -hmm. And synagogue is where, uh, uh, they go to the temple three times a year, really, for the feast, for all those feasts. And what do they do yes. in the temple? They slaughter animals, they make sacrifice, sacrifice, mm -hmm. sacrifice. So you can compare it to the church. Synagogue yes. is close to the church because that's where they meet every Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. house is completely, has nothing to do with either the congregation or it has to do with electrical things, whereby they keep the produce, agricultural produce to give to the and everything. So I don't think it is talking about the titan. So uh, let's answer uh, Sister Kemi's question. So Sister Kemi's question was a language problem. Mm. And that is the problem is, is similar to commanding, commanding the morning. Let me uh, give you, a, a, let me help you by giving you the title of the, of the verse you are quoting. Bring, uh, bring me to remembrance. Pleading with unfaithful Israel. So you know what that means, but you have not, that is verse 22, Isaiah 43, 22. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with, I have not caused you to serve with grain offering, nor worried you with incense. You have brought me no sweet cane with me with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities, verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your cause that you may be acquainted. Hold on, NKJV, NLT, because now it's a language problem. Hold on, don't talk here too. Let's get back to 22. You will see how explanatory it is. Dear family of Jacob, you refuse to ask for my help. You have grown tired of me, O Israel. You have, you have not brought me sheep or goat for burnt offerings. You have not honored me with sacrifices. Though I have not burdened and worried you with requests for grain offerings and frankincense, you have not brought me fragrant cal calmos or pleased me with the fat from your sacrifices. Instead, you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your fault. I, yes, I alone, will blot out your sins for, for my own sake and will never think of them again. Let us review the situation. What is the situation? Issue of issue of what? Disobedience. Sin. And sin. sin. So let's review. That's NLT. NIV. NIV says, review the past for me. Mm -hmm. Review the what is the past? They are sinful behavior. They are disobedience. They are not yet responding to God. Right? NLV says, review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. Prove yourself right, like God was telling Job to. So, put me in remembrance there is no money. It's God challenging them. It's a rebuke. It's not a doctrine. So whoever now goes there and pick it, put me in remembrance. Oh, put God, does God forget? Is it not God? It's a language thing there. And if KJV is difficult, let's use NLT. NLT. Like command ye me. Like I command ye me. So, so to help ourselves not to be confused, we should read it to get the whole story. I understand, Sister Kemi, we have used this place severally. Put God in, mm. for, in forget. Put God in remembrance. Then ah. you'll be shaking your head. I'm bounding. I'm bounding. 
Uh, All right, <laughs> let's stop the recording so long. Huh? Uh, before we stop the recording, let's pray together. Let's thank God for the opportunity yes, to study right. together as a family, for the comfort and the confidence that comes from knowing His word and His ways. We have been deceived in time past, but to God's mercy and God's truth has come free to us. Thank you, God. Free us. Thank you, God. Freedom. Wrong from the lies of men that has been said, the clever lies that sound like truth, but they are not. God, in His love, in His infinite and mercy, not only absorb this has truth, come to set us free from all these man made lies. We are very grateful, our Lord and our God. Thank you so much. We ask for confidence again in you to trust your sovereignty, to trust that you are wise, you are in charge, and you are in control. Lord, we pray for a fresh revelation into your attributes. That we will not forget that you are all wise, all knowing, all powerful, that you are great. Help us to find comfort and confidence in the word you have spoken. Holy Spirit, be your truth to us. Teach us, our great teacher, teach us your word. Help us have confidence in the word you have revealed to us. And help us, Lord, as we live in this world, that we will not be deceived. And the lies that flies around. Set us free yourself, Lord. Let your truth set us free. And free us completely. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Welcome.